Hello, Lisa here. Welcome back to my channel and welcome to what I believe is probably going to be a pretty long video. So if you are not in a place to watch a really long one, cool, cue it up, maybe watch it later or watch it in multiple parts or put it on while you're doing your laundry or your dishes. Maybe not dishes, that might be a little loud. Anyways, I'm going to be taking you on a very slow, leisurely stroll through the Gorgon's Tarot by Dolores Fitchie. This deck is new to my collection and is blowing my mind a lot. And part of the reason that that is is because it's flown completely under the radar. I'm pretty sure this deck was published in 2014. I'll double check that when we dive in. But it's a round deck and I feel like as somebody who's been looking and looking and looking for a round deck that spoke to me, this one has me super, super excited. I love all of the artwork. I'll be diving into that with you as we take a tour through the cards, but it just really has me super excited. And I just am surprised that more people haven't been talking about it. So I'm gonna be sharing it with you and we're gonna go through every single card, have a chat about the imagery and my thoughts on the imagery as we move through. Keep in mind, because this deck is new to my collection, these are kind of like first impressions. I have looked through the deck already and drooled over it in my own time, but it's still, you know, young in the grand scheme of the other cards that I have. But I just think it's coming to the tarot world with a really unique and fresh perspective. And it, I just want to give it some more airtime out in the world because I just feel like everybody I've mentioned this deck to, only a couple people had even heard of it. Most people I talked to about it hadn't heard about it at all. And yeah, I just feel like it's like a little unsung hero in our tarot verse. So with that said, I'm going to dive right in. This is a deck by Dolores Fitchie and it is put, published by Shipper Publishing and it looks to be their red feather division. Um, the box is really nice. It's one of Shipper's sturdy boxes with the ribbon um, magnetic closure and the ribbon to lift the lid. The box itself probably would look really, really nice on a shelf. You guys know me. I'm going to be whining at Peggy to make me a <laughs> special tarot pouch for it. There's a bit of text that I want to read to you from the back of the box and a bit from the book as well before we dive into the artwork. So if that annoys you, feel free to skip ahead. I am also going to be doing a little bit of a chat about the cardstock, the size of the deck and all that kind of thing. And then we're going to dive into artwork and we'll actually go through the guidebook in more detail at the end of the card art walkthrough. So I will try to remember to put some timestamps so you can jump to the parts of this video that most interest you. But if not, feel free to speed this up or skip ahead to the parts that you want to see. And with that said, I'm just going to dive right in. So the back of the box. A round, mostly black and white deck with two lurking splashes of color, the Gorgon's Tarot is an innovative and inspired way to read the tarot. With Dolores Fitchie's discreet, tongue-in-cheek humor, it's also engaging and fun to read. The traditional 78-card deck is complemented by an additional major arcanum card, the Blind Gorgon. This card can be used in a reading as a wild card, as what some tarot authors call the significator, or as a general atmosphere-setting concept. Unabashedly feminine and a restrained pion of praise to the animal kingdom, it features a largely female cast, lots of animal companions, commentators, bodyguards, and familiars, and a mixed bag of traditional and not-so-traditional imagery, with traces of unorthodoxy here and there. It is suitable for both beginners and experienced readers, and ideal for those who enjoy images with more than one meaning, who can make up their own stories by simply looking at the images. All you need is an uninhibited imagination. And it does say here, Dolores Fitchie 2014. And so I got this deck off of Amazon, but it's a Schiffer deck, so you can probably get it from anybody who carries Schiffer locally or ask your local metaphysical shop to bring this in for you if they have a relationship with Schiffer or are able to purchase Schiffer products. So don't despair if you don't see it in an online retailer. Remember, you can always go into your local metaphysical shop and ask them to bring it in. So it didn't come black edged like this. I did edge it myself with a chisel tipped black Sharpie but I want to talk a little bit about the size of the deck and all that good stuff, but first I want to read to you a little bit from this guidebook. So you can see the size of the guidebook like there. I'm going to get the box out of the way. So the Gorgon card is the bit I want to read. So I'm going to zoom us in on the card. Actually, before I read to you about the Gorgon, let's talk about the size and the backs. So these are the backs of the cards. They're this really, really nice um, snake design. And if your eyes follow the patterns of the snake, you can see that one snake wraps around into the center like that. And the other snake wraps around this way. 
it's just a really cool design and I really enjoy looking at that. But let's talk about the size because this deck is massive. So to give you some perspective, this is a standard Rider weight, or not Rider weight, standard tarot size deck. This is actually the Robin Wood Tarot by Robin Wood. Um, some of you have seen this around the Tarotverse. It's been around a long time. But this is just a regular standard size deck. And height-wise, you can see, if I bring the corners down to the bottom edge of this round card, we've got about that much room at the top, tons of room at the side, and actually, you can fit two side-by-side -side without completely touching. Let me see if I can do this properly here. There we go. So if I scoot over to touch this side, yeah, so you it's actually a little bit wider than two standard-sized tarot cards side-by-side. It's wide. So if you picture that with your hands, right, it gives you an idea of how large this deck is all the way around. So on my hands, and I have pretty big hands, I can stretch my hands around about half the deck and it's a stretch. You can see my thumb is kind of working there, right? Um, more comfortably about a third of the deck. Um, I probably will be able to rough, ruffle, rifle shuffle this deck um, because there is a bit of flex to the cardstock. And it's very high gloss, about as glossy as an oracle card, so you can really see some reflection. But the cardstock itself, itself, because it's laminated so well, does feel sturdy, but it's still flexible. And that's one thing I will say, if you're going to have a very thin cardstock, the lamination does seem to help it hold up better. So I'm pretty pleased with that, no complaints, and I think it works fine as a glossy deck. So with that, I'm going to zoom us in here on the Blind Gorgon and then read to you the bit in the guidebook about her. Sorry for the wobble, there we go. Okay. So, this is the story of Uriel the Gorgon, the far roaming, the wanderer. She defied the gods and went her sweet way in her quest for knowledge and truth. She examined the obvious, the banal, and the unquestioned with a forensic eye and prodded the unseen with a sharp stick. She looked outwards into the world of received opinion and inwards into the bottomless pits of her own soul, and she found as much treasure as she found dread. And the more she knew, the more she understood how little she knew, and so she kept going until she came upon a brick wall of glut, and then and there she reflected that, on occasion, knowing so very much is just like being blind. Now she is off on a sabbatical, and although she's, she still roves the wide worlds and the tranquil arid deserts, she looks inside at her huge repository of facts and fiction and tries to make sense of it all, to find a coherent pattern to what momentarily looked like demented filigree. Her fires are behind her, but not too far behind. She can always reach for them when the chill of loneliness gets into her bones. The bones of her own mistakes travel with her, a salutary reminder of the hazards of hubris and vanity. Her heart remains pure, but thorny, true to its nature. Her strong, tenacious familiar will never desert her, nor will her passion. Her astute little rat whispers sweet nothings in her ears and sings her love songs. And when the going gets too rough, she tells her educational silly jokes to ward off despair. This card does not advocate we renounce the pursuit of knowledge if this is what we seek and long for. On the contrary, it merely informs that there is a flip side to this pursuit, a price to be paid loneliness and possible ostracism and even excommunication from polite society are regular currencies a feeling of hopelessness is not uncommon either it is also a reminder that what is known cannot be unknown for knowledge is not the same as information we can pretend ignorance feign innocence or claim we have forgotten but we know we're just faking it fragments of information we can forget knowledge never we can overthink or sorry overlook specific trees but not the entire wood in a reading, this card may be warning you to think twice before embarking on a quest. Is that the way you want to go? Is it the right moment to go? Are your boats seaworthy up to the journey? And once you get there, will you be able to deal with the locals? Ignorance is never bliss, but knowledge at the wrong time can turn out to be a grand waste of time and energies both. And it goes on from there, but... And I know I read a lot of text just then, but I think this really sets the tone for the entire deck. The Blind Gorgon is this idea that we learn from our mistakes, we bring with us our past lessons learned, and that's what we see here with the skull. You know what, I've got a little chopstick here, let's do that. 
less fingers in the way. So we learn from this little skull. This is her terrier companion, and he looks like a bull terrier. And then this is her little rat companion up here, which also brings um, a little bit of lightness to the cards. There's another animal companion we'll encounter throughout this deck that I wanted to share with you because I thought this was a really cool element as well. And that is a little leopard. So here's what it says in the beginning of the book about the leopard you'll encounter throughout this deck. A word on leopards. Well, one leopard actually. In my world, his full name is Olufemi Mubarak, and he comes from Nigeria. His head appears in several cards as a, as a side and very occasionally snide commentator to whatever is going on in the narrative. I, quote, found the original version of him way back in a book of African and Caribbean proverbs and witty aphorisms. It was one of the many graphics that peppered the book. I did some work on the original, and he's been working with us ever since. He is one of my most beloved characters. His wit is on the mordant side, and his integrity above suspicion. He's as tough as old boots and as cunning as, well, a leopard. He can be stern, but he's never gratuitously cruel and never spiteful. So we kind of have these personalities of some companions. We have sort of the supportive loyal dog, the sort of chipper um, cheer little rat that's there, I think, to kind of bring some levity. Um, you don't see the leopard in this card. And what would I just say in his name was Olafumi? How did I say that? Let's see. Olufemi. Olufemi. I'll try to remember that. But he will be appearing throughout the deck as well as some other animal companions. So that gives you an idea of what we're getting into. And I'm already 11 minutes in and you've seen one card. So we're going to just move this along and we'll see how we do. So we get into our fool next. And the fool in this deck is female. And I really love that she's traveling lightly here. There, You still see this like alligator crocodile kind of character. I think it's supposed to be a crocodile. Please feel free to correct me down below. We see our little bull terrier here. We see the rat friend. Um, we see she's holding a rose or a flower here. So we still get that idea of purity. And I think there's even like almost this is a feather in her cap. And she's also got the white flower in her belt. So I feel like all the Rider Waite Smith imagery that we need is there. We also have some flowers down here. There's some, I think these are calla lilies here. I'm not sure what flower that is. And one of the things you'll notice as we cruise through the art in this deck as with this black and white, there's all these repeating patterns, and I actually find that those patterns make the deck and the art really easy to look at. I feel like because we have things like this repetitive pattern here, and then a completely different pattern here, and another different pattern here, it just makes it easy to sort of see what's happening. Some black and white decks to me start to look really um, dizzying, and I think that's because if it's just black and just white with no texture, it's almost like hard for your eyes to focus, so I really appreciate that about this deck. I also really enjoy the font and the large black borders. They just work with this deck. So next we have our magician, and I love this. As I'm, You're going to hear me say I love this in a lot of these images. But we have the sun, we have the moon, we have the snake here. Um, I feel like I see a bunch of chakra messages here. I see this like star sort of symbol right where the heart chakra would be. And I also see some action happening down here where the root chakra would be. This looks like a lotus, but this could also be a fire underneath. Um, and this gives the impression of a person who is made of the universe. And that's what I think when I look at this image. So lots to unpack here, but I really like that everything's contained within the whole universe is contained within this figure. And I like that this figure also has a um, sort of lit up third eye and, and um, crown chakra as well. I just, there's something about this that feels otherworldly in a really cool way. So next we have our high priestess. We have our little rat friends here. We don't see our bull terrier in this particular card. Uh, we still have a scroll in her lap here and she's wearing what looks like a um, onk around her neck. And we get this like free flowing feeling with her hair. We still have the veil. This looks like the moon to me. So really classic high priestess. That's everything I really need to see. We see the indication of some water behind her here all good. I love this one. I really enjoy this Empress card. So we have, these might be meant to be the dogs, like the bull terriers here. Again, we see some what look like lotuses in front of her. I love that there's an apple above her. This looks very like languid and luxurious and sensual. We have this little black cat right here. She's clearly in a garden. I just love this. It's very free and open. 
I enjoy this this emperor, sorry. Um, we see all the rigidity we're used to seeing. He's still got his hand on a, what looks to be like a globe. There's like a sword here going down into the ground. We have almost a hint with this piece here to the order and the rule of the Hierophant. He's got a little um, alligator or um, crocodile type companion at his feet. There's the bald eagle here next to him. We see his sort of domain or his city. But all the art in this gives us that rigidity, that, that structure feeling that we're looking for typically in our Emperor card. Next we have the Hierophant. And the Hierophant to me looks female, looks to be almost like a nun type figure, but I really like that we still have the two pillars, we still have the sun and the moon and sort of the universe and water behind. I still get this impression that we're looking at somebody who's got the gateway, it's like sort of the gateway to information, who is guarding those secrets, guarding all of that. We have these like two little white and black fish here, and we have the skulls and these little crocodile figures again instead of the supplicants, but we still have the keys. Um, I really like this. It still speaks to everything that I feel like it's meant to speak to, but again we have almost um, an onk like shape here and then almost a cross like shape above it, which is really interesting. Sort of speaks to religion in general without trying to be so specific as to what religion. Okay, I really like this lover's card. One of the things that I thought when I first looked at this image was, oh, of course, the lovers are both looking in the same direction. And this feels like a blessing or um, what we would see in the Rider Waite Smith as sort of an angel who is overseeing what's happening. This, um, that's who this seems to be. It's almost like they're giving this blessing of love to these two who are both gazing in the same direction. I just, I really enjoy the idea of that image. Um, I really like how positive this is. And one of the things you'll notice as we move through this deck is that a lot of the figures are a little bit androgynous. They're either feminine looking or um, the males are clearly males in several cards, but they're more androgynous. They're a little softer in their features and I, I appreciate that. I really enjoy this chariot. I love the fireworks and this idea of celebration and success of sort of celebrating some kind of victory. But we also have these two little dragon figures that are going in opposite directions. And these sort of remind me a little bit of um, our snakes on the back and how their tails intertwine. These um, dragons, their tails or their bodies rather are intertwined even though they're facing two opposite directions. It kind of reminds me of that feeling when um, somebody kind of sneakily ties somebody's shoelaces together. It's like they're not only going in opposite directions, but if you're not careful, they're actually going to get tangled up with each other and they're going to like fall. So I think that's kind of funny. Um, what else is there in this card? So this is one, this is the card that represents cancer. Oh, this was the other thing that stood out to me about this card was look where the reins, she's not holding reins. The reins are directly connected to her heart chakra. Um, or possibly, yeah, this is definitely heart chakra. So you get this idea of leading from the heart and letting that will and that drive pull you forward. It's not physical force. And I really thought that was cool. Here's our strength card in position eight, as I like it. <laughs> we have almost what looks to be a little fox type character over here. We still have the woman with her lion friend and we have a little bunny looking character over here. We have some water. Um, this looks like it might be like a bear or a wolf. So you get this idea that she's out in nature. It's almost on the edge of being empressy, except for she's clearly befriended this lion. I don't know, I just love this. I love that the tree has leopard spots in it. Okay, this is definitely one of my favorite cards in the entire deck. This hermit to me is everything. She's clearly in her cave, so you get this idea of cave with these shapes up here. You can see like what looks to be a beach with palm trees and a big sun happening in the distance. She's got her little campfire going. She has all her little rat friends here with her. And what's she doing? She's looking in a mirror. And if, you know, <laughs> the, the Hermit card for me is very, very much about introspection, looking within, trusting your inner knowledge, your intuition, and this just speaks to that. And illustrates it so clearly and simply. I just, I can't even with this card. I just love it. Oh boy, I have so much to say about this Wheel of Fortune. Let me have a sip. <laughs> Look, we're 20 minutes in and we're into 10 cards. Wish me luck, folks. Okay. If you've ever had a reading from me and you've gotten the Wheel of Fortune, you've heard me talk about my personal 
probably heard me talk about my personal analogy in my head for the Wheel of Fortune. One of the very first um, intuitive tarot readings I ever gave somebody, when this card popped up, not this specific card, but when the Wheel of Fortune popped up, I thought of, I, I often um, read and think in pictures, and what occurred to me was this concept of the childhood playground and those Wheel of Fortunes that, I'm um, not Wheel of Fortune, sorry, the merry-go-rounds that kids push. So it's like a, a piece of playground equipment and kids will push it and so, kids, different, other kids will get on the merry-go-round and the whole merry-go-round spins. And so some kids will sit near the edges and you see these figures here near the edges. So some kids will sit near the edges and there's railings to hold on to or they'll stand up and they're resisting those changes. They're resisting the movement of the wheel of, of the, I can't explain this properly. Please be patient with me. <laughs> Um, but there, there's, there's wind resistance when you're on the edge of a moving platform that's circular. And so those are like the kids that are feeling the ride the most. It feels the scariest at the edges. But the kids that want to feel it a little bit less, they move into the middle. And to me, the reason this is a great analogy for the Wheel of Fortune is because when we sit in the middle, when we move into the center of change, into the center of that turn of the wheel, we feel it less because we're moving with the wheel. We're not resisting it. So this particular shape and the way these figures are positioned just totally brings that right to mind. But there's so much more to unpack here. There's like these little symbols in implying that each turn of the wheel is full of the unknown. Who knows what you're going to get. Some things look like they're going to be not so great, like this eye with the tear in it. Some things look like they might be fine, like the sun and the moon or what looks to be a little leaf. Here we think something's maybe being taken away with the minus. Here we think something might be added with the plus. Here we might have something really exciting with the exclamation mark. And then here's more unknown with the question. And I feel like if this card comes up in a reading, because this is a round deck, depending on what symbol is upright, you could, as a tarot reader, you have so much more you could dive into. There's also these like sort of snakes in these sections. There's little snails. I just, there's so much to kind of catch your eye if you like to use imagery intuitively when you're reading the tarot. So I just, I love this card. In the Justice card, we have again some little foxes here. We have our bull terrier here. We have the upright sword that's not leaning either direction, which I like to see in my Justice card. We still have the water behind. We have the scales, like it's everything I need in a Justice card. The hanged one rather than the hanged man and we have what looks to be a feminine figure um, we have just a little animal friend kind of checking on her over here um, we have the enlightenment with these rays of sort of light that are surrounding her head but she's looking very serene and peaceful and she's being held by what looks to be a little snake wrapped around her leg this could also be a lion I suppose but I see it as a little snake friend love this death card I mean I like the whole deck I'm gonna have to stop saying that but I just really love this. There's almost like this dance with death happening here. The shape of this particular snake, this kind of figure shows up multiple times in the deck. And it makes me think of Kundalini and this idea of opportunity and of transformation and of stepping into your power. So that's something I could key into as a reader. I just, there's so much here. There's, these look like little cat friends, actually. I just, I love this. In the Temperance card, we have lots to look at here, too. We have sort of these dark and light energies mixing, which is a neat take on it because a lot of times we see fire and water here, but dark and light is like yin and yang. We've got, you know, the angel, her third eye is open. Um, we have this eagle figure here. I mean, if you're into animal medicine, I'm sure there's actually more, too, to unpack with the plants. Yeah, I love that. Here is the other card in the deck other than the blind gorgon that has red. And because the red is only appearing in those two cards, it packs a lot of punch when you pull it up um, or when you pull up the card in a reading. So our devil card, we have this hand. We have this sort of downward moving arrow, arrow which implies to me being weighed down by um, negative behavior patterns and habits. Here we see the the central focus in this card seems to be this figure. The The eye looking down has bigger arrows, but we also see that she's being separated from others in her life there's a disconnection happening um, she's cut herself off by nature of her choices and her behaviors it's really interesting I really love this tower card we still have our bolt 
happening and hitting the tower, we have that downward arrow again, which is kind of, to me, a reminder of the downward moving energy from the Devil card, kind of like, okay, well, this is what happens. We have a little snake friend again here, but she's coming out, almost like exploding out from within the tower. At least that's what I get from all these little arrows that are surrounding her. It just, it feels like that part of a tower image that can be really, really empowering. Like she's, yeah, she's had this big, all this structure has broken down around her and yet, and yet, it looks like she's gonna be emerging stronger than ever before. And there's this opportunity for growth. I also like these two sort of sun images because you get the idea that before the lightning bolt, the sun was setting, almost like, okay, well, the sun has set on the past. Now it's time to step into the, oops, oops, I dropped my thingy. Then it's time to step into the future, and that's where all this brightness is, and the sun is rising on the new paradigm, on what's going what's gonna to be the new life. The star, and I love that we have what looks like a little, like, seal, or, like, yeah, it looks like a little seal friend here. I hadn't noticed that on my first walkthrough. Love the water here, love the vulnerability and the peace. I like this really obvious um, central star. Pretty. I freaking love this moon card. I know I said I was gonna stop saying that, but I'm not gonna. This makes me think of drawing down the moon. This makes me think of connecting to the moon in a spiritual way. Um, you still get these sort of pillory feeling. Um, you still get this idea of the subconscious with all of this water. And this idea of emerging from the subconscious, only instead of a crayfish, it's the central character. I love that the moon, like the sun, has all these rays sort of beaming and, and streaming down. I just, I love that. And then we have our sun. And we have these two figures lazing, sort of naked, nakedly enjoying the sun. Everything is exposed, brightly lit, and clear. I like that. I also really enjoy this judgment card. It's very non- Christian in its approach, but it could be perceived Christian if that's your lens that you're looking at it through. I just like that it's more open. You just have all these figures evolving and, and lifting up, um, stepping into their new reality. I love it. And our world card. My usual symbology I look for is here. We still have this ring because a lot of times the world being associated with Saturn can be about boundaries um, as well as the cycle, as well as completion, as well as, you know, getting ready to step into a new cycle. She's holding on to these little snakes here. Love it. So our first minor arcana suit we're going to dive into is the wands. Love again, this rising snake energy, which makes me think of kundalini energy. Snakes rising. You also have this almost basket. You get this idea of that... Um, person who's, I don't know what, what that's called, snake charmer. <laughs> you almost get this idea of a snake charmer. There's this energy that can be harnessed. Love it. I love our feminine two of wands. You get this idea of listlessness, of being ready to embark on a new journey. You have our little cat friends here. The wide horizon, the ships going by. Oops. The three of wands. I really enjoy this. Again, waiting for your ship to come in. This is very classic Rider Waite, and we still have our little rat friend peeking in here. We have a cat friend here. The Four of Wands. I love that these are two female-looking figures here. Um, this has almost an initiatory feeling for to it, and I see the Four of Wands as the milestone card. I just, I really, really like this image. Here we have the Five of Wands, and we have, this just made me think of snakes in the grass. So like while these girls are arguing or having whatever sort of competition they're having, they are about, these two girls here in the foreground look like they're about to get bit. And to me this speaks to how competition takes our focus off of what matters, and we tend to miss things, miss opportunities for growth. Our Six of Wands, lots of success, but there's that lack of that laurel wreath. We don't have that same sort of, um, I guess, sexual symbology happening here, but everything is looking like victory and celebration. I enjoy that. Seven of Wands, definitely a fierce position here. She's like, yep, I'm going to be holding my ground. I, it feels strong and confident. Even the face on the moon in the background looks confident as well. And we have a little nod to the star. And the star, to me, this is almost like a keep the faith reminder. 
So I like that. And we have our Bull Terrier friend back. I really enjoy this Eight of Wands. You get that feeling like you're standing in the picture and all the wands are coming at you. It's almost like that perspective you have when you're looking at um, the imagery in like the Star Wars movie, how all the stars are, are like whizzing by you because they're going at light speed. And that's what, make me, that's what it makes me think of for sure. And we have a little bird companion in this card. That could be the messenger. Here again, we have the Nine of Wands. And when I first flipped through this deck on my own, I put the Nine and the Seven side by side. Because here we have somebody who's holding her ground, but she's still very much on her feet. It's a very active process. Whereas the Nine of Wands has much more of a, okay, like she's been through it. She's getting bogged down. I see this sort of what looks to be like almost rope around her. That might not be what it is at all, but that's what I see in the image. And she's sitting on a little pillar and you get this idea that okay I'm still holding my ground but it's getting it's hard here so I just I really enjoy that being able to see those two or the progression and then in the 10 I love that she's sitting here looking at her big pile of stabs here of wands and like has this look on her face like I don't wanna because I know what that feels like right sometimes it's not that we're actively carrying the burden and doing an awesome job sometimes we're like legit like I don't wanna we know we have to but we don't want to. Here's our page of wands. A little bull terrier friend. Yeah, she looks like she could definitely get into some scrapes, some adventures. The knight of wands. I will say the knights in this deck, like this one looks like he, the horse looks like he's in emotion. I love the facial expression on this horse though. It almost, the horse itself almost looks a little mischievous. Mischievous? How do you say that? And then here we have another little rat friend just peeking in, keeping an eye on things. I really enjoy this Queen of Wands. We have the cat in the moon. We also have the cat right here and she looks very sure of herself and fierce. Really like that. And our King of Wands. He literally to me looks like he's, he's actively thinking of his next idea, of his next pursuit. Like he's completed one journey, he, know, he knows he's good, he's, he's succeeded in what he's been trying to do, but I get the feeling that he's like, yeah, okay, now what? And here we have that kundalini shaped energy again with the snake rising. Into the swords. Ace of swords, and we have these like angel-like figures holding the sword or presenting the sword. The peaceful two of swords. And these two little rat friends just sent, kind of checking on her like, are you okay? You doing alright there? The Three of Swords. What's interesting to me about this is this figure down here. We typically see the Three of Swords just focusing on this sort of imagery in the center. But then we see there's like a, an a animal companion here. I'm not quite sure what kind of animal that one is. But she's sort of staring backward or staring at the sun setting, staring at this um, heart with the three swords. And this kind of makes me feel like the three of swords sometimes, it's about those painful lessons we learn, those experiences that help us to grow and to learn and evolve. But I almost feel like she's perhaps maybe spending a little too much time looking at those mistakes or those lessons, perhaps beating herself up a little, just kind of lingering in this space longer than she should. The Four of Swords has this really beautiful meditative quality to it. Again, we have this almost kundalini-like potential. It's almost like this coiled potential energy I see, just sort of uncoiling. It's almost like through her introspection here, through her meditation, this is starting to rise. We also have some, again, what I feel like are nods to the chakras. We have root, we have sacral, heart, and crown, all with little lotus-looking flowers on them. So I think that's really interesting and it gives me something to chew on because I really enjoy working with chakra energy. This five of swords, so great. And here we see, this is the first time I've spotted him anyways, Olufumi or Olufemi, right here, the little side um, leopard guy. And we also have our little rat friend over here. Interesting, we have these stars, or yeah, the stars just above. And I love like this interesting we don't see the defeated person here. What we see is definitely a clear image of self-defeat. You know, we've got the four swords that she's got, but then stabbed right through her is the fifth sword, and it looks like nobody's responsible for that but herself. 
And the Six of Swords, I really enjoy when people, when artists do the Six of Swords so that the swords are left behind. Because a lot of times I see this as, the, well I always see this as sort of an escape card. We're getting out of a difficult, complicated situation. We're moving away from this energy and we're growing. We're getting, we're getting out of it. Um, but sometimes those swords are in the boat uh, with Rider Waite Smith and other decks. And I like when it's not in the boat because it lets me as the reader um, speak to leaving that crap behind. <laughs> and I really enjoy that. The Seven of Swords. Here we see a figure. She's got all the swords. And there's the city. And she's alone. And I looked this one up in the guidebook when I first was exploring this deck and I loved what the guidebook had to say about this card. It kind of speaks to how she she took all these swords so that she could protect herself from a possible attack that was probably not actually probable. Like no one was going to harm her. It was all sort of something that she got worked up about and she took these actions that she didn't necessarily need to take. And I love that perspective on this card. It was really, really cool. Our Eight of Swords. Here again, we have the little bull terrier friend here. He seems pretty chill, like it's fine, she'll figure it out. <laughs> and we have again this snake, but the snake is going downward. It's almost as if the snake is emerging from within her and is about to help her pull out this sword. And as soon as she pulls out that sword, she'll be free. So there's a lot here for me to read as the reader. It could be about the hesitation to pull this sword out, not trusting her gut, which is telling her which, which sword to choose to get herself out of this predicament. There's just a lot to dig into. Love this Nine of Swords. I love how all the swords, because of the shape of the card, are coming right at her. And it gives you this very trapped, overwhelmed feeling. Um, and yet, you know, you, feel, you get this feeling like if she just moved her arms away from her body, she could like poof, cast them all away. I don't know. That's what it makes me think of. This one really, this deck just really gets my imagination going. I like how in the Ten of Swords, she's not actually stabbed. She's lying on the ground as if she's been stabbed. And all these swords are around her and they're super close. Like it's almost as if she threw herself on the ground to duck as all these swords came at her and she's laying there as if she's dead, but she's not. All these swords are here. All she has to do though is just get up and walk away. She's okay and she'll be okay. I don't know, I like that. Our page of swords. <laughs> I love how forthright this figure looks. Um, we also get this, uh, all these like fireworks again. We have the little rat friend here, but she's kind of ignoring them. So you almost get this idea that she's a little bit separated from her, um, maybe her, her inner joy or lightness. It's like she's too serious almost. She's got this fierce like falcon like familiar with her. The Knight of Swords, this is the one that I think of when I think about the lack of movement in the Knights. This just feels very static to me for the Knight of Swords, so I'm not overly fond of that image, but you still have this look of sort of determination on this character's face, and I really love how the sun is like giving this dude some side eye, like, what you up to? What you doing? <laughs> you can kind of see the gaze, just kind of like, huh? And then down here we have a little cat who looks like he's toying with a mouse or something here in the foliage. And it's interesting how you could interpret that as being a reflection of our Knight of Swords. He also has a little falcon um, companion. Here we have our Queen of Swords. And I love that she's got this, she's just buried in books, which I love. Her sword is down, but she's looking at you straight on. She's got these little, um, again, I don't know what animal this is. This is the second time we've seen them. Um, little companions behind her. But the sword is right in front of her chakras. It's also right in front of her heart, specifically where her hand is. And we have this little snake guide. We also have um, Alpha and Omega represented here with the A and the O. And there's more to dig into there, and I'm not going to even try, but it's, uh, I believe it's referenced in the guidebook. Some of you may know, though, right away. And here's our King of Swords. The King of Swords, I, I love he's got this like husky companion. Um, and he's got like one eye open and one eye closed, which sort of speaks to some of the guarded nature of the sword's court, um, I feel like. And we have the snake again rising up here around the sword. His heart and central chakra area isn't blocked. He's still quite guarded, but he's a little bit more um, evolved, I think, with his energy. And I love this just really spirally sun in the background. Into the Cups, which is of course my favorite suit of any deck. I love the sun and the moon here and the Ace of Cups and all of this water, this um, these wavy lines just give you that really fierce water feeling. I love that. I love all the, um, the fullness that you feel here. 
our two of cups. I love that this is like a lounging mermaid and this androgynous figure is obviously a, a human, fully human. So there's a lot to unpack there in terms of two people coming from very different backgrounds but forming a connection. We have a little sheep companion here um, and another little jumping fish down at the bottom and they're obviously by the water. So they found a place that's sort of almost like in a liminal space where there's sort of water, land, yeah. I know what I'm trying to say, hopefully it makes sense. Love the Three of Cups. You still get this idea of celebration, but we have this um, Oluf Olufemi again is back, our little leopard, and he's giving them a little bit of like a watchful eye. And that to me is almost like a warning, like yes, enjoy your celebratory time, but don't go overboard or get too careless. Here in the Four of Cups, very Rider Waite Smith here. This person's pretty content to just have her feet in the water. She's got her little cups behind her. She doesn't need to do anything. She doesn't need to make any changes. She's good. And meanwhile, her higher self, her angel or her guardian is over here with another cup. Like, um, excuse me, you have more work to do. Here we have our Five of Cups. Again, very Rider Waite Smith here. The three cups are spilled. We have sort of Literally, it's uh, water under the bridge, right? Or is it supposed to be water over the bridge? Either way, there's a little bridge over here. We have a setting sun, um, a town, and it seems like she's definitely grieving the past. You get a lot of feeling of past just with the way this is illustrated. And right by the two cups that remain, there's our little um, rat friend, but he has wings, which is really interesting. The Six of Cups. Again, whenever I see somebody in this sort of loungy position, it gives me the feeling of taking time, like not being in a hurry. And here we have somebody who's in that loungy position and she's gazing into the pool of water where there's all these other cups. And this is like a mer creature, a mer, a mer woman, a mermaid. <laughs> there we go. I knew that word would come to me eventually. And it kind of harkens back to the couple from the two of cups. And you kind of wonder if this person's like, living in the past, wishing things could be different than the way that they are now, wishing they could have gone differently. It's interesting. It gives you a lot to work with. In the Seven of Cups, this one's a very familiar thing. And we have some, that question mark again, like what we saw in the Wheel of Fortune. We've got like what looks to be a crown. We have what looks like almost like a horseshoe, maybe? A little boat, some papers, a heart, um, I think, and a snake. There's some interesting, very clear symbols here, which as a reader you can definitely work with. Which cup will you choose and will it be, you know, will you end up with the snake or the crown? Will there be an opportunity for adventure? Will it just be the unknown? Will you go for love or knowledge, career? I don't know, there's just a lot to unpack there. The Eight of Cups, I really enjoy the different ways that the Eight of Cups is depicted. It's, a, it's an important card to me in my practice and in my life. And we have this character who's definitely leaving her built-up cups. And with her, she's got her Bull Terrier Guardian. And I love that she's got this little tiny bag. It's almost like she's traveling light. She's only taking forward into her future what is really serving her, like what she really needs. Love this little boat out here with the yin-yang. It implies that she's... And the star again here and here speak to faith um, and trust and hope and optimism. And I just, I also feel like the little yin yang looking symbol right here, which is partially obscured, that reminds me of um, obviously balance and implies that where she's headed is to a place of more balance. Love this Nine of Cups. I really love when the Nine of Cups card is depicted in a cozy, like comfortable way. Um, I like that she's sort of indoors, she looks really comfortable, she's got this beautiful water view, all these cups everywhere, these lovely little carpets. Um, she, I don't think I spot any animal companions with her. That's the only thing I would think would be missing from this, but she's got a bouquet of flowers here. She's relaxed, her posture's relaxed. Oh, there's her animal companions, her two little rat friends are right there. Yeah, I really like that. The Ten of Cups. Now this is really great to me because this, a lot of times in the Ten of Cups we see a traditional, like, and when I say traditional, like the cultural norm of like, you know, a guy, a girl, a couple kids, a dog, you know. And I love that this is like a community. Um, it's that feeling of emotional fulfillment, but it's, family can look like all kinds of ways. It's not necessarily like a marriage with children. It could be you know, a chosen family, a group of friends, um, a community, a neighborhood. There's so many different ways that we can get that emotional fulfillment. It may not look the way 
we think it's going to look. The Page of Cups. I adore her. I love that the water is spilling out down the side. It just kind of makes me think of the way that pages, the Page of Cups can sort of let her emotions spill over really, really easily. Um, it's a little bit less controlled and less mature. The Knight of Cups. A little bit androgynous. I like that. Um, we get all of these stars, which kind of lends that dreamy quality to the Knight of Cups, which we expect to see. Um, there's this fish just sort of flying in the air. Um, still a cup being held and carried. Yeah, I like it. I am so thrilled that the Queen of Cups is a mermaid. I think that's perfect. I also love that she's holding a trident, which we would normally associate with sort of the leader of, uh, or the ruler of a water kingdom, so I love that. Um, I love that her cup is not completely capped over like we often see with the Queen of Cups, but that it's it's just guarded by her arm. It's like she, she can easily expose it or cover it at will. Like it doesn't feel quite so rigid as a like formal covered cup like we would see in a Rider Waite Smith deck. So I really like that. The King of Cups, he's also got a trident or yeah, he's also got a trident. We've got this really great animal cat familiar here. He's also a merman. You can see his tail kind of wrapping around him like this, and he's still got a trident. But interestingly, both the king and the queen had tridents. They're both leaders in their own rights. On to the pentacles. I love that she's holding a little baby here and is surrounded by lots of growth. You get this sort of caretaker feel for sure. Oh, let me go back to this, actually. I had something else I wanted to say. Um, the Ace of Pentacles, a lot of times, I was thinking for the, of the Queen for a minute there, but when I was first flipping through this deck, the reason I liked this idea of this baby being held close and of the Ace being on the card together is that the Ace is often that new opportunity, but we have to, like, nurture it. We have to be cautious with it in the beginning. Um, give it time to grow. That's what that made me think of. The Two of Pentacles. I love how serene and balanced and poised she is. Um, I like that everything is equal. You don't see one pentacle higher than the other like we might in the Rider Waite Smith and that gives you some interesting things to speak to as a reader. The Three of Pentacles. I really enjoy this because here's her, well, here's her little cat familiar which I like. But I like that she's, she's working. It looks like she's doing some creative work. In my head it's almost like she's got like, almost like this might be like a, a reference photo and she's drawing or painting. And you have this all these other pieces here, it might even be that she's building a stained glass window um, with the lines there, like what we would see happening in the um, Rider Waite Smith deck. However, behind her, instead of another human person, she has like a guide, a guardian, a winged figure. At least that's what I see. It could just be a trick of the drawing. But this looks like a sort of a guardian. And it almost speaks to collaborating with your guides, with your guardians, um, leaning into help from spirit as you do the initial parts of your work. The Four of Pentacles. She's definitely holding her resources close. She's a little boxed up and confined by her stuff, but she's also protective, protected and being protective. She's inside her home, she's not going out. So there's a lot you could definitely dig into there. We have another little cat friend here and a little heart all the way over here with her cat friend. So you almost get this idea that she's locked herself up from really enjoying um, bonding even with her pet. Interesting. Oh, the Five of Pentacles. I really, this one just tugs at my heart, and I think it's because, you know, we see that there's all these resources around her. There's um, a female or a feminine symbol here, the, um, the Venus symbol. There's some books. There's knowledge. Over here, we've got a cup. There's another kind of cross. There's a key. Um, there's her animal friend seems bigger. It's, this is the Bull Terrier friend. And he's like trying to almost like wake her up, like, come on, come on, you got this. And she's holding what looks to be sand that's slipping through her fingers. There's just, there's just a lot there. Even though the imagery is simple in this deck, I just feel like there's so much. Here we have the Six of Pentacles, and we have this person here being what looks to be the, the giver or the one offering some sort of charity or generosity. And these figures look like they have some mixed feelings about it. We have a little rat friend here, and here's our Olufemi keeping an eye on things over there. The Seven of Pentacles. 
she looks to be pregnant and so she's waiting we've also got what looks to be ripening fruit on the tree so a lot to work with in terms of waiting for the right time um, being patient knowing that certain things are out of your hands but you just have to wait and see how it's going to turn out at this stage sorry i keep bumping my camera and i'm not sure how i'm managing to do that all right then we have the eight of pentacles and here we have somebody who's got looks like some very um He's got like a little anvil, what looks like some kind of um, measuring tool. Or there's a little hammer here and there's like a saw blade. Um, another animal figure here. So you definitely get the idea, he's got these finished pentacles. So he's, he's definitely mastering his craft, getting more specifically detailed with his work or her work. Here we have our nine of pentacles inside the garden. We still have the wall here. And she's got her bird companion. It's very Rider Waite Smith. She's got her hand on her resources. The ten. We still have the arrangement of the pentacles in this Kabbalah shape. We have like this family over here, and here we have another winged figure. And these bull terriers are like greeting the figure. And there's a bit in the guidebook that's really interesting in this about how, you know, this figure is about to walk in and maybe change everything in a good way, but it's still about to you know, shake things up. Things this the first journey has ended, another one's gonna be beginning. So they're at that threshold of change. The page of pentacles. I love that this figure is just sitting in the ground in the grass and like what looks to be a bunch of other foliage and petting her cat and just enjoying being in nature. The Knight of Pentacles. We've got like a bull, it looks like or a bison in the background here, which is cool and very carefully holding the pentacle as we like to see very steady like it our queen of pentacles look at this caring for what looks to be i don't know what kind of um, animal companion this is either a large dog i'm not sure and then there's a little cat here i see what looks to be little are these little tails down here these might be more of the little mice just kind of tucked under her skirts i'm not sure that's interesting. We have Saturn up here in the distance, which is cool. I might have to look that up. And then our King of Pentacles. Now this character does look a little bit um, like a vampire up here to me for whatever reason. Um, but we have a cow or a bull rather in the background, the city over here. Um, definitely holding on to money. There's a sense of power here for sure. So that is the walkthrough of all of the cards. I'm going to just do a quick shuffle so you can see how it shuffles, but I'm going to zoom us out and then we'll take a quick look at the guidebook. So as you can see, I feel like there's just so much you can sort of look at with regards to the symbols, um, which I just, I just think it's really great. As a reader, there's so much to see. And interestingly, I think that color definitely would have distracted from that. So I'm just going to try and see if I can do a side rifle. Let's see if I can manage it. It's really a large deck, you guys. Let's see. Oh, it's a stretch. But I can manage it. I can manage it. Um, I can also, oop, I think if I was going to hand over hand, I'd have to figure out a different way. Because I can't quite do it. I don't think I can quite do it. So, oh, I guess I can do it sideways. It's going to take practice. Let me do one more side ruffle. You might have to do this one in smaller piles, but let's see if I can manage this one. Ooh, again, my hands are big, so... I would say this would be difficult with this deck. You could spread it out on a table and swirl it around. I know lots of people who do that kind of um, that kind of shuffling. Otherwise, I would just take small piles and just do it by hand this way. Oh, we have our flipped over lovers. I don't know how that happened. Um, so let's just do a single card from the top. We'll look that one up in the guidebook. Totally copied that from Ethany. I've seen her do that in her videos. So she does wonderful walkthroughs every Friday. Check it out. All right, so the Wheel of Fortune was the card that we got. Let's take a look in the guidebook. So before we get to that card, there is the intro on a word on leopards that I mentioned before we got started, some acknowledgments. I don't think there's any spreads in here. There's a little bit about reading round cards and about the deck, and then you just get right in. There's the Blind Gorgon bit that I read. I just read to about halfway through the second page. There's a little bit more there. And then you get into the cards. So let's go to 10, the Hanged Man. Or sorry, the Wheel of Fortune. What am I saying? So that which cannot be bent, bought, or bribed. Oh, that's really interesting. 
Fortuna Imperatrix Mundi. Up goes her wheel and down it comes, sometimes swiftly, sometimes at a leisurely pace, taking us all in its merry-go-round, be we pr Oh, it says merry-go-round! Oh my god, okay, I'm in love. Be we princes or paupers, and down come tumbling the best laid plans of mice and men at a flicker of milady's pinky. Accordingly, it will never do to get too cozy either with your prosperity or your misfortune. Lady Luck, also known as the Unpredictable, sits at the hub, unmoved and serene. Now and again, she takes a sip from her cup of shocks. Yes, milady drinks occasionally. You would too if you had to do what she does. And that, then there's some traditional meanings, change, random fortune, chance, accidents, the basic instability and mutability of all things, possibly the very essence of life, and reversed would be struggle against events we cannot control, fighting fate, delusions of being able to control the uncontrollable. Oh, you guys, <laughs> I am really excited to have this deck in my collection. I've got a little bit of black on my fingers because I just edged this deck last night and it's rubbing off on my fingers a little bit, but that will settle as the deck has more time to dry. I just did that like basically 24 hours ago. So when it has more time to sit and um, soak in, it'll be fine. So there we go. Oh, let's not stop with the tower on there. Pull up. Actually, let's pull up the back. So that's better. It's a better way to end this video. Thank you so much for hanging out with me for this very long, detailed walkthrough of the Gorgon's Tarot. I really appreciate it. I would love to hear your thoughts down below on this deck, and especially if you managed to sit through this entire thing. Any thoughts you have to share? Opinions? Perspectives? How did you sort of, what did you think of this artwork? What did you think of this deck? Have you heard of it before? Because again, it's been out since 2014, you guys. So anyways, with that, thank you again so much for joining me. I will see you all again very, very soon. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, do all that fun stuff, and hit the bell to be notified of when I go live or of my new videos. Thanks so much, and have a great day or evening wherever you might be. Bye, everybody.